So let's continue talking about the continuous time impulse function. Let's talk about what happens when we have a continuous time signal x of t. So this is just kind of a little cartoon of the continuous time signal x of t. And what happens when we multiply it by a impulse function or maybe even a sequence or train of impulse functions. So this over here is what I call an impulse train. It's just a collection of impulses spaced regularly in time. In terms of this little cartoon I've drawn right here, you can kind of see what happens. I had this continuous time function. I multiply it by a signal that's zero most places. The only places it's not zero is at the location of each of these impulse functions. The result of this multiplication, not surprisingly, is a signal that contains a lot of zeros because all the zero regions in my pulse train result in zeros. But what happens to the impulse functions themselves, they end up taking on the values of the underlying signal. So you can kind of see this continuous time signal wobbling around right here. That's basically the outline that the amplitudes of these impulse functions follow as a function of time now. So just kind of in terms of a cartoon, you can basically see what happens here. The heights or densities of these impulse functions get modified based on the value of the continuous time signal at the appropriate time. So where the signal was low, we have low impulse heights. When the signal was high, we have high impulse heights. So really when multiplying a signal by an impulse, we're just scaling the height slash density of the impulse function. Again, if I use the term height, we know that the height of an impulse function is always infinite. So if it gets scaled by some number, by say, say that number is 2, say that number is 0.4, well, that's still infinite height. So when we are talking about impulses, really these arrows are infinitely tall, and the numbers associated with them are their density. If we were to integrate across it, we would end up getting that value. Sometimes, though, um, just in talking, we say height, but really what we mean is the density. If I was to integrate across it, what is the density of that impulse? And when sketching things, even though they're all the same infinite height, we sketch them in a height proportional to their density. So if something has a low density and something has a high density, we usually sketch these infinitely tall arrows in the correct proportions to kind of visualize that. So the previous chart kind of gave a cartoon for what happens so we can just kind of mentally and conceptually understand what's going on. Let's actually do the math now so we know mathematically how to do this manipulation. So first of all, we're going to assume we have some signal x of t that is continuous at the location of the impulse. So x of t is a continuous time signal, and just for the sake of argument, we're going to assume that any time we multiply it by an impulse, the signal x of t doesn't have anything weird going on there. There's no strange discontinuities or anything. We're going to assume that x of t is a nice, well-behaved, continuous function at any point in time that we want to multiply this impulse by. So what I'm really doing in terms of multiplying x of t by my impulse is I'm doing this math right here. I'm going to take x of t, and I'm going to multiply it by the impulse function delta of t. Recall the definition of the impulse function. It's zero practically everywhere. It is zero everywhere except something happens at time zero. So the only interesting thing about this signal happens at time zero. In terms of the cartoon that we just draw, drew for this product, we know what happens. The resulting product is going to have zeros everywhere. The only thing that's going to happen is my impulse at time zero is going to get scaled by the value of the signal at time zero. So the result of this product is again just an impulse located at time zero, because that's the only time something happens other than zeros, and its height is going to get manipulated by the signal at that time. So the result of this product is simply an impulse at time zero scaled by my signal at time zero. So this whole thing collapses to just an impulse scaled by x of zero. X of zero is just a number, so this could be three or minus two or pi or 700. My impulse has been scaled by just this single number. Let's do something similar, but just a little bit different. This was an impulse at time zero, and we were going to multiply it times this continuous function or continuous signal x of t. Let's do something very similar right here. The only difference is I'm going to deal with the impulse located at time t equals capital T. So this right here we know is actually a time-shifted impulse function. This signal is zero everywhere except when little t is equal to 
capital T. Because when little t is equal to capital T, then I would have capital T minus capital T is zero, delta of zero. So that's where the interesting things happen in this signal right here. So if I was to multiply this impulse, which is located at time t equals capital T times the continuous time signal x of t, what am I going to get? Well, we know what we're going to get. We're going to get an impulse at the exact same spot in time, so I can just write that down, except its height slash density is going to be changed. It's going to be changed by the value of my signal at time t equals capital T. So that's why I have evaluated my signal at time t equals capital T. It has changed the amplitude or density of this impulse function. So surprisingly, multiplying an impulse function by a continuous time signal is pretty easy. Every time you do that, everything collapses to just where the impulse is located. In this case, it was located at time zero. In this case, it was located at time t equals capital T. The only thing that changes is the density of the impulse function gets manipulated by the signal at the time where the impulse is located.